When we think of ancient Italy, we normally think about the Romans, the Republic, and later on, their vast empire. After all, their importance to Western civilization in really, well honestly, everything cannot be understated. I could go on about their achievements and how they've influenced our world today, but I'll save that for other programs that are specifically about the Romans. In this program, I want to focus on a people whose achievements and ideas influenced the Romans. These people were the Etruscans, who in most books about early Italian history are eclipsed by the Romans. However, it's Etruscan culture that greatly influenced the social and political development of what became Roman civilization. And that, my friends, is what we're about to discuss. We call them Etruscans because they came from a region of Western Italy called Etruria, just north of the site that would eventually become Rome. However, they called themselves the Racena. Their earliest history, like much of their culture, is a bit of a mystery. One theory, more like ancient legend actually, is that the Etruscans were the descendants of a people who had migrated from Western Anatolia, specifically the area called Lydia. The basis for this was due to their language, which is much different than anything else that was found on the Italian peninsula at the time. However, today, most scholars consider the Etruscans to be the descendants of the local Italic indigenous population, who between the years 1000 to 800 BCE formed their own distinct civilization. Regardless of whether or not they migrated to the Italian peninsula, the Etruscans were extremely fortunate to be living in Etruria. This is because the area was replete with a lot of valuable minerals and metals. Before long, the Etruscans became extremely wealthy, and this wealth enabled them to become the dominant group on the Italian peninsula. By around the 700s BCE, there were several well-established Etruscan city-states. From these, the Etruscans expanded rapidly and established cities and colonies across the Apennine Mountains, the Po Valley, Tuscany, Umbria, and eventually even around Rome itself. But they didn't just dominate the land, they were active on the seas as well. The Greeks called them Terhenhoi, which is where the Tyrrhenian Sea gets its name from. The more we study history, the more we tend to see a lot of similarities among developing cultures. Like the Sumerian city-states and later on those of ancient Greece, the Etruscan city-states were proud to be self-sufficient and independent. While they shared many cultural traits and a common language, each city-state had its own government, laws, and unique customs. So, as one might expect, there were fierce rivalries between many of them. However, the Etruscans did come together and cooperate when they needed to. One way of doing this was through a loosely organized council known as the League of Twelve Peoples. This organization dealt with issues that were common to all member city-states. In many cases, these issues dealt with religion, but sometimes they'd form trade agreements with outside parties. However, these latter agreements didn't always hold because certain members would cheat on them, causing more conflicts and distrust between city-states. The one good thing about the League was that it never attempted to oppose any centralized control over individual city-states. However, it could grant or withhold financial or military assistance to any member of the League for good or bad behavior. Coordinated action was the exception rather than the rule, and for the most part, the Etruscan city-states generally acted in their own self-interest. The one strength Etruscan society had was that it was adaptable and took many of the best things from the other civilizations that it encountered. Their constant trading with Greeks, Carthaginians, and even Egyptians exposed them to new ideas from areas of the world that arguably were much more technologically advanced than themselves. Along with adapting pottery styles from the Eastern Mediterranean and sculpture techniques from the Greeks, the Etruscans seem to have adopted a version of the Phoenician alphabet and from that created their own. This later was passed down to the Romans and became the basis for their own alphabet. In general, the urbanized Etruscans looked down upon the rural Romans. They considered them to be less sophisticated farmers who lived in huts without much in terms of high culture or art. Despite their distrust and distaste for the Romans, the Etruscans had a lot in common with their southern neighbors. As Roman society developed, it in many ways mirrored that of the Etruscans. For example, 
Some early Etruscan city-states were monarchies that were overthrown and replaced by republics. Despite what may seem to be a sort of early democracy, power in the city-states was kept in the hands of aristocratic families, much like the patricians later on in Rome. In 616 BCE, the first of three Etruscan-born kings assumed power in Rome. Beginning with the reign of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, who reportedly ruled from 616 to 579 BCE, Rome was transformed from a small village on the Tiber River into something resembling a small Etruscan city-state. We're told that brick buildings replaced its mud huts, that sewers were built, roads were paved, and the city's first temples erected. The next two kings of Rome, Servius Tullius and Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, also known as Tarquin the Proud, were also Etruscan. By 510 BCE, the Romans had seemingly had enough of their Etruscan rulers. Tarquin the Proud was overthrown, and the monarchy was completely disbanded. From then onward, Rome became more powerful as the disunited Etruscan states began a slow but steady period of decline. During the 400s BCE, the prosperous Etruscan city of Veii and Rome were constantly at war. Though Veii was much wealthier and was said to be replete with weapons, the Romans were able to lay siege to the city for several years. Finally, in 396 BCE, Roman forces under Marcus Furius Camillus, supposedly by digging a tunnel, entered and eventually sacked the city of Veii. They plundered anything of value, killed all the men, and rounded up the women and children and sold them into slavery. Now what's interesting is that the other disunited Etruscan city-states didn't seem to care too much. Yes, Veii was an important city, but it had also been a great rival to most of them. Few, if any of the other city-states, thought that Rome would be able to venture further north to pose a significant threat to them. They, of course, were wrong. Rome began a series of campaigns against other Etruscan cities, including Tarquina, Dodicapolis, and Phalerae Veteris. After decades of war, the Romans were able to defeat them and maintain their push up the peninsula. The continued Roman pressure from the south and attacks from the Gauls to the north eventually wore the Etruscans down. By 264 BCE, the Romans had taken the last Etruscan city of Volsini, making their conquest of Etruria complete. Though Etruscan cities were under Roman control, Etruscan culture and language lived on. In fact, it was only after 200 years that Latin replaced it in Etruria. Of course, by that time, the Roman Republic had conquered a good part of the Mediterranean world, with its official language of Latin being spoken everywhere its soldiers went. However, it's safe to say that without the Etruscans, Rome may have still been that small village of huts rather than a city on the Tiber River. So I hope that you got a little taste of who the Etruscans were and just why they're so important, especially to the formation of Western civilization. If you learned something from this program, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Also, follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Check out the website as well. Thanks so much for stopping by. Keep the world safe for rock and roll and catch you next time.